Tom, you're going to need to uh, turn the microphone on at the box. There's the button on the top. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the class on the Arctic melting. Our presenter this morning is Bob Hollister, a professor of biology at Grand Valley State University. He heads up the Arctic Ecology Program at GBSU, a multidisciplinary re disciplinary research project funded by the National Science Foundation. He is currently co-chair of a network of research sites studying the impact of warming on tundra. His educational credentials include a P PhD in plant biology and ecology, evolutionary and behavior, an MA in botany and plant pathology, as well as a bachelor's degree in Lyman Briggs zoology. All are from Michigan State University. Now, although his training and credentials are in biology, he has worked in the Arctic for nearly 30 years and chaired one of the longest continuous research groups studying changes in the Arctic. This long-term experience has given him an in-depth working knowledge of international concerns and historical relationships between countries as the melting Arctic has presented new challenges to really all of mankind. Uh, Professor Hollister has, is married with three children and lives in Grand Rapids. So with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Robert Hollister. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, I'll give a little talk about the research I do after we do the video. Um, but I'll also say that, you know, as chairing an international group, I've been involved with kind of the geopolitical, but, but much less, much, I mean, I'm the scientist, but, you know, when you do research in a location, you always, your ears perk up when, uh, when you hear something about the politics of it and so forth. So not necessarily the expert on geopolitical, but certainly, certainly aware of it and been working through it or with it for the last almost 30 years. So without further ado, we'll do the video and then I'll give a, a, little, um, a little presentation of exactly what I do and then we'll take questions after that. So I think remotely we'll do the video. Hi everyone. Um, yes, we're gonna do it like we have in the past. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I will ask for a, a thumbs up from anyone in my Zoom gallery that you are hearing the sound in just a moment. You should all see a black screen and now I'm pressing play. For all of recorded history, anyone seeking access to the vast, untapped riches of the Arctic has faced one key obstacle, ice. But the frozen north is no longer quite so frozen. As the polar ice cap retreats, the Arctic is becoming a focus for economic development and geopolitical rivalry. Great Decisions investigates the ambitions of Arctic powers, both old and new, and asks whether a spirit of cooperation can endure in one of the Earth's most inhospitable regions. The fight over the melting Arctic. Next on Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Herford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. The 
old mariners fought for the Northwest Passage because they believed it would prove a short commercial route between the East and the West. The route which Amundsen has located will be of considerable use to whalers, but it is unlikely that anything else will come of it. National Geographic Magazine, 1906. By the time the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen completed the first transit of the Northwest Passage, it was widely understood that Arctic shipping routes offered no commercial value. But now, more than a century later, the Arctic is changing. In 2019, Anchorage, Alaska experienced the highest recorded temperature in the history of their state. If there's any pretense about us uh, being in denial about climate change, all they have to do is look to Anchorage and understand that it's the honest to God truth. In July of 2020, Arctic sea ice cover hit its lowest ever recorded level. Scientists are predicting in the next decade or so, we may start to see some ice-free summers. Climate change is going to impact the Arctic and it's going to impact the conditions of navigation. It could shorten the trip from Asia to Europe. If instead of taking the south route, you could go north around Russia. In 2016, the Crystal Serenity cruise ship became the largest passenger vessel to sail through the Northwest Passage. It sailed from Vancouver to New York. We're at the beginning of what we can anticipate will be an increase in shipping into the high latitudes. The melting of Arctic ice is making it easier than ever to access the region's untapped mineral wealth. Ice melting has both positive and negative consequences. Access to the uh, hydrocarbons and uh, other mineral resources and bioresources in the Arctic is uh, expanding. 13% of the world's undiscovered conventional oil resources reside in the Arctic. 30% of the undiscovered natural gas, nearly a trillion dollars worth of minerals, including gold and gem quality diamonds. Geopolitical strategists around the world have taken note of the Arctic's new possibilities. Today, many countries are working to expand their influence at the top of the world. The heightened interest in the Arctic has brought China and Russia together. As Russia and China become more active uh, in the region, the U.S has realized that it needs to increase its engagement. The region has become an arena for power and for competition. And the eight Arctic states must adapt to this new future. During the Cold War, the Arctic became a battleground as the US and the Soviet Union faced off across the pole. What was once the impassable Arctic now provides the quickest routes for attack from a wide sector of Europe and Asia. Geopolitical competition is going to become a more dominant feature of the Arctic. And this is also an area that the United States has somewhat neglected over the, the past few years. When we thought the threat of, uh, of over-the-pole ballistic missile attacks had ended, we were premature in our view that competition in the Arctic had diminished. And I think we will now pay a price for having to hurry to catch up. Hurrah! Hurrah! President of the Federation Vladimir Putin has quietly worked to strengthen Russia's strategic position in the Arctic to a level not seen since the Cold War. The 
Russian president has very clearly explained that one of his main goals for the for Russia's Arctic policy is to develop the northern sea routes. It would mean upgrading a lot of transport infrastructure, port infrastructure, and so on. They're not messing around. They understand the value of the Arctic. They're establishing bases and activity up there, natural resource extraction. They have the most modernized strategic and nuclear submarines very close to Norway, but they have a bigger strategic ambition. And that I would say is mainly a strategic competition between Russia and the United States. We are strengthening scientific, transport, navigation, and military infrastructure, which will allow us to secure Russia's interests in this strategically important region. Some experts contend that Russia's military buildup should not be seen as a provocation. Former Soviet facilities are being opened back up. They're building out additional uh, infrastructure there, modern infrastructure. They're putting in uh, longer runways. Uh, but a lot of what I have seen and what I've heard is that it's defensive in orientation. Well, you could ask me if I'm concerned. I'm not. Uh, I, I, I think if that is a threat to anyone, it's a threat to the polar bears primarily. There's a need to have some sort of security presence in that enormous space. Russia, perpetually strapped for cash, has been forced to turn for help to the newest player in the region, China. After 2014 and, and the Western sanctions on Russia following Crimea annexation, Russia had no other choice than to turn toward China and accept Chinese investment. Russia and China are cooperating quite closely on the Yamal liquid natural gas project. Yamal Peninsula is in the Russian high north. It has a large natural gas reserve, but Russia for a very long time has not had the ability to explore that natural gas because it requires large amount of, uh, of financial capital. Although Russia and China have cooperated effectively on oil and gas exploration, experts caution that the two countries' interests in the Arctic do not always align. On the one hand, uh, China is, is uh, perceived by Russia as a promising uh, partner in the Arctic. But on the other hand, the Sino-Russian relationship in the Arctic is sort of a marriage of convenience. Russia has no illusions about Chinese interest. Russia strongly identifies as an Arctic state and would be unwilling to countenance a partnership with China where it's no longer the leader in that region. I think China is mindful of that and has tread cautiously with Russia and the Arctic. As China has ramped up its investment around the world, the Arctic has become part of its global strategy. China has integrated the Arctic in its Belt and Road Initiative, calling it the Polar Silk Road. And the idea is to build infrastructure to be able to use the region as a, as a shipping route. The 2018 Arctic White Paper by China states what national interest China sees for itself in the Arctic. Chinese are quite clear that they have an economic interest in, uh, in the Arctic and they have interest in the governance issue in the Arctic because the changes in the Arctic region has a global impact. Chinese companies have sought investment opportunities in every Arctic country. But to local officials wary of China's ambitions, such investment is not always welcome. China will use the same methods that it has done in the rest of the world to promote a Chinese agenda that is not just about making money, but it's also about establishing a strategic foothold. 
China's actions in Greenland have been very controversial. Chinese construction companies bid to renovate three airports, and uh, that elicited concern in the United States. And Secretary of State Pompeo approached Denmark to warn them against this. I think we should pay attention to anything that is a precursor to military presence in the Arctic. Investment in Greenland's airport for tourism, benign. Investment in Greenland's airport where you might ultimately control that as a base, not benign. For many years, China controversially sought membership in the Arctic Council, an intergovernmental forum for the eight Arctic countries to discuss common issues. In 2013, China finally earned observer status within the Council. China has successfully got itself into the room uh, of the Arctic Council, but it does not yet have a seat at the table. So that actually has created quite a lot of frustration in China about its Arctic policy. Many years ago, we kind of had the Arctic to ourselves, but the latest development is that also non-Arctic states are very eager to take part in, in uh, I think, what they see as an Arctic adventure. One of China's arguments is that because climate change in the Arctic is a threat multiplier, it affects China as well as Arctic states. But Arctic states claim that they are the stewards of the region and other states outside it should play by their rules. American policymakers have taken an especially dim view of China's interest in the Arctic. In May 2019, at the Arctic Council ministerial meeting, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo castigated Beijing for its behavior in the region. There are only Arctic states and non-Arctic states. No third category exists, and claiming otherwise entitles China to exactly nothing. Being there in the audience in that very uh, speech, it was rather strange. There has been some sort of agreement that this is for functional cooperation. So let's keep it like that. The criticisms and accusations made by individuals on the American side regarding China's involvement in Arctic affairs are completely inconsistent with the facts. Moreover, they are contrary to the general trend of peaceful cooperation in the Arctic. Mike Pompeo plays the Arctic in the context of great power competition, uh, which was also unusual for the Arctic Council because the Arctic Council does not deal with security issues. In Mike Pompeo's defense, anytime you try to ignore reality uh, for, uh, for collegiality, uh, you'll lose collegiality more permanently. It's very important that we recognize that our challenges with China and our challenges with Russia, we can't pretend they don't exist. In 2019, an unusual proposal brought the Trump administration's Arctic strategy to the top of the nightly news. The Wall Street Journal is reporting today that President Donald Trump and his senior advisors have floated the idea of purchasing Greenland. Officials from Greenland, which is an autonomous part of the Kingdom of Denmark, have responded by publicly declaring that their island is not for sale. Although the plan to buy Greenland was swiftly dismissed, American policymakers are paying more and more attention to the Earth's largest island. The U.S. has opened a consulate in Nuuk, the capital of Greenland, in May 2020. It's a statement of America's commitment to the Arctic as non-Arctic states look to exploit the region for their own interests, as I warned of back at the Arctic Council. The U.S. has also approved of a minor aid package to Greenland. That's for purposes such as economic development, so that Greenland, for example, can start making money on tourism. That was one of the areas where China was interested in investing. I think a lot of people don't know that we have an air base up in Greenland, the very tip top. I've been there a couple of times. 
our facilities in Greenland, they're the pickets. They are the, uh, the eyes and ears for the U.S. Uh, watching for threats coming, coming uh, from the east. In Alaska, experts are sounding the alarm about the lack of American infrastructure in Arctic waters. The U.S., they say, is not prepared for the coming surge of shipping. It reminds me of the, the stories of the early Arctic explorers, uh, many of whom were, of course, rescued by Inuit. We will be, in all likelihood, the first responders because of the lack of infrastructure and availability of response services throughout the Arctic. We're gonna need icebreaker capacity to be available we're going to need more Coast Guard investment. They need a uh, full base on the western coast of Alaska that's fully operational and available. In April of 2019, the Navy and Coast Guard awarded a contract to VT Halter Marine for the detailed design and construction of a polar security cutter. When we think about our maritime uh, national security objectives and the need to support economic and commercial and our scientific interests. It's just critical that we begin to field these polar security cutters. Fundamental to U.S. Arctic policy is the question of how to balance the Arctic's economic potential with global climate concerns. For security purposes alone, the United States shouldn't be holding back on its oil and gas production capability. What we don't produce, the Saudis will, the Russians will, the Venezuelans will. And I believe it's very important for the United States to be a player in the global energy market. We've already discovered enough fossil fuel reserves to push us beyond the safe level of warming that was agreed to in the Paris Climate Accords. Opening up new areas like the Arctic is completely inconsistent with limiting climate change to a safe level. Now, policymakers must decide whether it is wise for the U.S. to spend the billions of dollars that would be required to turn the Arctic into a geopolitical battleground. It's very expensive, uh, both to build and to maintain. Uh, but if the United States is committed to this competition with China and with Russia, and if we believe that the Arctic is a worthwhile domain of that competition, this is the kind of investments that are necessary uh, for us to be able to sustain that kind of intense engagement that's going to be required. What we need is not competition. What we need is collaboration. It's a lot easier to work on the assumption that competition is, is inevitable and therefore to funnel yet more money to the Navy and to the Air Force uh, so that they can undertake this militarization uh, of the Arctic. I think that would be a large mistake. When the Arctic Council was founded in 1996, its members agreed to use the forum to discuss environmental and cultural issues rather than security. The Arctic Council uh, has as its primary objective to, uh, to promote cooperation, coordination and interaction uh, between the Arctic states uh, and the Arctic inhabitants. It is explicitly stated that the Arctic Council is not dealing with military security. It's probably one of the main contributing factors to the Arctic Council being able to continue to operate, I would say, relatively unimpeded. It has now a heavy emphasis on sort of climate change, environmental issues, uh, practical economic cooperation uh, between the participating states. I, I don't see that as changing. Security issues, I think, will be fairly difficult to bring into it. Although the Arctic Council members had long cooperated on environmental issues, climate change became an unprecedented sticking point at the Council's 2019 summit in Finland. In May 2019, the Arctic Council meeting was the first time that there was not a common declaration that was adopted at the end. And, and the main reason was that the United States did not want uh, climate change to be mentioned. We didn't sign today the Arctic Declaration. It is clear that uh, climate issues are different 
from the different viewpoints and from the different capitals. Arctic Council ministerial meeting in Rovaniemi, Finland in May 2019 displayed that there are some new challenges. And the indigenous peoples organizations definitely expressed our concerns about that as climate change is a major concern for us. Some experts believe that if the Arctic Council is to remain collegial, it may be necessary to find a new forum to encourage dialogue between the U.S. and its strategic rivals. NATO allies and Russia, they have a body called the NATO-Russia Council. That's where the NATO allies discuss uh, security and defense with, with Russia, and that should be the place where we continue to go and discuss uh, these, these issues. What we need to do is, is to be able to meet uh, those nations with, with military forces up there and talk about confidence building measures. Talk about other ways that we can avoid surprising each other with military deployments. I would use a fora that's not set up yet, but I would, I would use one that is not the Arctic Council. Because the capitals of all eight Arctic nations lie below the Arctic Circle, it will be essential for policymakers to listen to those who live in the region. What I learned at being in the Senate is their inability to understand on the ground what's going on is pretty high. They don't live there. They don't live in a community that's 30 below. If the local communities and the state are not engaged, uh, then it will be, in my view, a long-term disaster for the area. If one recognizes that every matter in the Arctic region is interrelated, then the issues of security, militarization, stability, and all of the related matters concern us, concern the people who rely upon this environment. Despite rising geopolitical tensions, the people who live in the Arctic are confident that the connections between neighbors will remain stronger than the forces of division. Our fear is that if there is a increased militarization of the areas, that the opportunities and the possibilities for us as one people to interact could be affected. But we also put a lot of, of confidence in the Arctic Council and that body for being an arena for discussion and dialogue between neighbors. Residents of the Arctic have long shared bonds that transcend national boundaries, forged by the common experience of life in a severe environment. Now, those bonds are being tested as the Earth's great powers turn their attention toward the top of the world. Great Decisions is America's largest discussion program on global affairs. Okay, let me just get set up here real quick. All right. Um, I think your mic might not be on. Could you go ahead and make sure the red button is on? Red button's on. Can you hear me? Uh, no, uh, not through Zoom. Oh, you know what? I can. Go ahead and... Um. I just turn it off and turn it back on. Okay, you're good. You're yep. good. That Thanks. always works. Turn it off and turn it back on. Well, you know what? I want to remind everybody at home as well. Um, I made, uh, you know, I have a lot of devices and you do at home as well. If you're having a hard time seeing, the first thing everybody needs to do, which I just did, is check your own device to make sure that your sound is turned up, which was my problem. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna um, share screen here. And just, it's a little bit of shifting gears, but but I'll try to tie it in a little better. So this is the, the work that I've been doing. Um, so changes in the Arctic, I'm at Grand Valley. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, it's just a little slow. Um, so I'm just going to do three. You are allowed to pick up your mask if you feel comfortable, or you can move around, whatever you prefer. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Um, so I'm going to do three parts, the observed change, kind of the importance of the Arctic, and then just a little bit of my research. And I'll do this kind of quick so that we'll have lots of time for discussion. But so, so the first part is just observed change. And the video just assumed that you already know climate change is happening, and it focused almost exclusively on sea ice. So I'm going to broaden it just a little bit. And just to put it in perspective, I mean, this is massive change. Um, and that's, this is the end of the century. So this is what we've already experienced and then the end of the century. And that's, that was global temperature. Now we're talking about Arctic temperatures. So what's obvious from this is the Arctic warms more than everywhere else. So even if we only had one or two degrees warming, we've already had one, but even if we only had the two degrees or three degrees that they're trying to you know, keep us under, well, you multiply that by a factor at the, at the high latitudes. So it's gonna get warmer in the Arctic. My research is um, northernmost Alaska, little uh, star here. Again, the video alluded to the sea ice, but here's more actual data. Um, I don't have this summer's yet because it's, um, it's not out yet. Um, it should come out any time now. It, they usually do it at the end of September, so it takes a few days to, to figure out. But that's just a, a, a satellite image of how white it is. Um, and you can see the 2012 here and the 2012. So in the 80s, I mean, this was relatively stable for a while there, and then it started to, to go down. And so that relatively stable was most of the Arctic was covered in ice in September, because this is the end of the summer. What that doesn't show is the thickness. And this is why the shipping is such an issue. Um, if you've got, so historically, so this is the 80s, all that red is more than four years old ice. If you've got ice that's more than four years old, it's pretty thick, it's pretty stable. It's very hard to get a boat through it. You, you really need a big icebreaker. And some of the icebreakers can't even touch, like, you know, the historic, there used to be, when I started in the 90s, they talked about 10 year old ice. No one even, you know, that, that's gone. Um, there's no such thing anymore. Now there's almost no four year old ice. So almost all the ice that we see is one or one years or less. So that means that freeze, that's no different than, you know, Lake Michigan can completely freeze. We don't need icebergs to, or icebreakers to go on Lake Michigan. I mean, you might if you went in January, but you, you, you could even get through with a relatively, you know, strong ship because it's pretty thin ice. So that's the, that's the, the real change is it's all really, really young ice. And there's very little of that thick ice. And that means that you can not only do you have less ice, but the ice that's there is very susceptible to melting. And from a shipping kind of perspective, you know, you don't need like, you don't need a nuclear powered icebreaker to get through this. It, to get through this, you do. Um, for the local people, whaling is still a really big deal. So if you're going out on the ice in the spring and you're on one-year-old ice, that's really, really, really dangerous. If you're on four-year-old ice, you can drive a truck. I mean, you can literally bring out like the big heavy equipment and use that to bring in the whale. They're not doing that because, because. But, but you go out on four wheelers and you can take your boat out on the, not four wheeler, but snowmobiles and you can do four wheelers and they usually get stuck. Um, but so it's totally different depending on the, how thick that ice is. Didn't talk about in the video, um, but the obvious thing is also Greenland is melting, Antarctica is melting, and it's melting at fairly high rates. Um, 
could talk at other times, but it's melting at the at the northern part just as much as the southern part, um, because this is because of water, essentially. Here's one that, that you probably haven't heard before, and this is a really big deal to people up there, is the loss of lakes and ponds. So you can kind of see in this image, like lots of little dots here, and those little dots are gone. Um, this is old news. I mean, this is from the 90s. This is a widespread phenomenon now that these lakes are disappearing. And the, the main reason why they're disappearing is um, naturally in a landscape, you have drainage. Um, I mean, if you go to Indiana, there's no lakes. I mean, there's stuff associated with rivers, but you know, Southern Indiana doesn't really have lakes. Um, they've got river stuff. You know, Michigan has lakes because of the glaciers, right? So, um, so naturally you'd have lakes disappear, but it's happening at a really fast rate because what's happened is frozen ground is really, really hard. I've tried to, you know, I put sensors in it and it's, it's harder than concrete or on par with concrete. So, and then if you thaw that, if it's ice rich, so it's got lots of little chunks of ice in it, you go from like harder than concrete to mud <laughs> that just, you know, it just, there's nothing, you know. Um, so as that gets, that thaw gets deeper, then that erodes and then you drain the lake, as simple as that. And that's kind of a, a widespread phenomenon. It's becoming greener. Um, there are a few brown spots. Those are mostly fires um, because it's also, as it gets warmer, the balance of moisture changes. So as you get warmer, you, unless it also gets more precipitation, then it just naturally gets drier. So you can have some spots that are browning, but most areas are, are greener. The plants are doing better. I mean, you're above tree line. So you add warmth and now tree line goes further north. It's not just tree line though, it's shrub line, if you will. It's, um, or plant line, <laughs> you know, if you go really high Arctic, you get nothing. Um, as you get a little bit warmer, then you get plants in the crevices. Then, as, then you get like plants everywhere, but they're small. And then you get plants that are bigger um, and then eventually trees but it's not just trees or nothing, it's this whole gradation. So, so those are some of the other changes. The importance of the Arctic, this is not from a geopolitical thing, this is from like a, a, uh, everything. Um, the main reason for climate is we've got warmer at the equator, colder at the poles. And, and that heat has to move. So in very, very simple terms, if you change the endpoints, the Arctic or the Antarctic, everything in between changes, as simple as that. Um, so now you could say if you change anywhere on the globe, it impacts everywhere, and that's true, but it's even more true if you change the endpoints. Um, and you've all heard about the polar vortex that's it's become, kind of wide, widespread, if you will. Almost every winter will have some, you know, cold event, but it usually only lasts a week or so. That's really cold. And that's because normally there's a bigger difference between the temperatures and, and you get this isolation, if you will, of the Arctic from the rest of the climate. As that difference is, is less, it wobbles more. And as that wobbles, we get colder. When we're getting colder, they're getting warmer. <laughs> it's a global thing. So globally, the polar vortex results in warmer planet, but it doesn't matter what the global temperature is. It's you know what what you feel is what you you know. So so I would expect those polar vortex events to continue to happen. There's three big positive feedbacks for changes in the Arctic. The first one is just real obvious. It's white, and then it goes to warmer, and that snow melts, and then it becomes less white. So what the point here is, um, this is kind of covering a little bit, but the, um, well, no, that down here, 80 
to 90% of all the energy hitting a white surface is reflected back. There was a cool thing about paint last week, you know, that they're supposed to actually cool things that they've discovered in Purdue University paint that is so white that it reflects more than it absorbs and you could actually cool stru stru structures. We'll see if that actually happens. But when you've got the Arctic that is just white, it doesn't absorb any energy. As it becomes not white, almost all that energy is absorbed. So the difference between white, 80 to 90% reflected back to space. Vegetation is, isn't shown here, but it's 20%. So um, vegetation would be 80% absorbed. Water would be 90% absorbed. So it's, it's, it, it's the flip. So you go from 80 to 90% reflected away to 80 to 90% absorbed. Is that as absorbed, it's warmer. As it gets warmer, it's less white. As it's less white, you absorb more. I could say this forever. Um, and that's, that's a huge positive feedback or reinforcing feedback. And that's one of the main reasons why the Arctic is warming so much. You see this really obvious in the, in the um, oh, in the winter, if you get like a few branches of something sticking up out of the snow, you get, it melts around that. And then pretty soon that whole little area melts. Whereas if it's just flat, if you've got a corn field, the, the whole corn field melts. Whereas if it was plowed down, you know, like you had the corn husk still sticking up, it, it melts pretty quick. Whereas if it was just flat, um, it stays white all winter. We haven't had a good winter in a while, so it stays white while it's not, you know, hot. The same idea with plants just sticking up. So what I basically just said, and this is more showing, I mean, this would be your typical Arctic landscape, but if you now got shrubs or trees sticking up, then you can actually absorb heat during the, the winter. You're not gonna be during the like 24 hour dark, but, but all spring, um, you know, you've got lots and lots of light and um, the more stuff sticking up, the warmer it gets. That's also true during the summer, but it's even more so during the winter. And then the other one you've probably heard a bunch about is the carbon release. So the soils, this is just a picture, this actually shows coastal erosion, but the, you see just how dark those soils are. It's um, darker soils are more organic rich. So the soils of the Arctic have more carbon in them than the trees of the rainforest. Everyone talks about deforestation as being a big contributor to climate change, which is true, but it's less than the warming of the tundra because as the warm the, the tundra warms that that organic matter starts to break down as that breaks down it's released to the atmosphere and um, it's global warming um, as the globe gets warmer you have warmer tundra it releases more carbon and that that's um, it's a it's a big deal um, it's on par with oh 90s level fossil fuel burning. Um, we've surpassed it by a lot now, but, but it, it, it's not a trivial amount. We've seen fires. Fires then would also um, contribute a lot of carbon. Um, what actually happens is that that soil is so organic rich that it can catch on fire. So, so, so the, the soils are actually burning. You can have that in wetlands around here if you drained them. You just don't usually because they're usually wet. Um, as you dry them, they can catch on fire. And then if you have more people around, um, so more exposure for, but, but usually these are lightning strikes, which as another aside, there didn't used to be lightning in the Arctic, now there is. So let's just put this in a paleo perspective. Um, that just is paleo perspective. So this is the, the temperature. This was produced um, a year ago. So this is you know, from 90 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius on, on this side. And these are global temperatures going back, you know, so kind of the, the now, the dinosaurs, and then the really old, right? Um, and you see climate change has changed quite a bit in the past. And we're in one of the cold spots, right? So if you talk to a geologist, um, or a paleontologist, they would say, look, 
climate change has happened in the past. No big deal. Um, it's, it's changed more in the past than it is now. And, you know, the world survived, if you will. I will point out that those, these, these divides for these big times are associated with climate change. And that's because, like, at these events, 90% of the species go extinct um, because climate change. So, so it is a big deal if you're a person. If you're a geologist just studying rocks, rocks will still be here regardless of climate change. But the organisms on it, you know, it's a big deal. And then if you're a, a tundra person or an Arctic person or a snow person, this is the world with ice caps below this dotted line here. And obviously we're in a world with ice caps. But lots of time in the past, Antarctica didn't have snow. Um, it had snow. It didn't have permanent ice. It didn't have glaciers um, or Greenland. So, so let's just zoom in right here. If we look, that little purple thing is the, the climate change that we're guaranteed to have. I mean, th that's, just, that's just adding our climate change projection. If I add a little bit, that's the uncertainty of what the climate changes could be, you know, kind of worst case scenarios, best case scenarios. We're flirting with the world without ice caps at all, period. Now, it, it'll take multi-thousand years for Antarctica to melt. So you're not going to have to worry about that. But your, I don't know how many generations, lots of generations later will. Um, and it'll be a slow process. Um, they're already melting. You're already in this, because here's the, this line here is the world without, I see, we're already kind of there. It's just, um, you know, we'll see. So let's just zoom in right here, just at the, the most recent. And so this is, this is that. Um, oh, my screen share is not going to do it very well. But um, you don't need the, the headings here. This is just the, the temperature. And this is where we're headed towards, right? So this headed towards is our analogous is the mid Pliocene period. So, um, so if you're a paleontologist, you go and look for environments like that. And, and I mean, you, you, you find that time period and you say, well, that's probably what we're going to experience by the end of the century. So it's kind of a, a, neat, a neat way of forecasting the future. And if you do that, you look and you say, this is, this is an artist's rendition of kind of mid-Greenland, um, where there are camels, or camel-like stuff. Everyone knows woolly mammoths. Um, but there's like birch trees and geese and, you know, it, it very, 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 very different. There are trees, there are, um, there are trees at northernmost Antarctica, or not, uh, uh, northernmost Greenland has big stumps from, from this time period. Um, and they're, they're preserved because they were under ice. So there's like these whole forest of stumps. It's kind of neat. Um, the point is, this is very, very different. And they can't even kind of wrap their heads around how this could be so much different. And, and one of the explanation is the only way they can make the biota match what they know is to remove sea ice during the winter. It's the only way they can get climate that, that supports these organisms during that time period is if you didn't even have ice during the winter. And you guys all know that, I mean, right here, if, if Lake Michigan is frozen, then it can get cold. If Lake Michigan isn't frozen, it's just not gonna get that cold within you know, a mile or two of, of the lake. Um, and, and you can say, well, wait, wait, what about uh, plate tectonics? Maybe Greenland just moved. No, uh, it moved a couple inches, but I mean, we're, the time periods we're talking about here, this is the, I mean, you can tell me a different, I mean, here's a little difference, but um, no, I mean, they're within feet of, of where they were then. So we expect major, major changes. So my research is just, what are those changes for the organisms? So here's just a really silly cartoon, if you will. There's tundra at the top of the mountain. 
you change the climate, you just expect everything to move up. You can, um, these are well established temperature gradients that are one degree Celsius for every hundred meters or which is two and a half or two degrees Fahrenheit or 150 miles is one degree. So you just say, oh, it just everything moves up. It doesn't really work that way, but, but it's a good simplification. And if you do think in those terms, then tundra is just gone. So my research um, known as the International Tundra Experiment Arctic Observatory Net, and it's funded as part of the Arctic Observatory Network. So northernmost Alaska, Upiavik, formerly known as Barrow, and then Akasuk, which is just a small um, 300 people village. And then we also are at Tulik Lake, which is a, a research station, just researchers. And then Naviat Creek is just a, it's just a, it's just a spot pretty close to the research station that you can drive to. But it, there, it, there are different elevations here. So you get different temperatures. So the idea just kind of forecasting what Northern Alaska might look like or documenting the changes that are happening and then kind of forecasting the future. And so way back in the nineties, um, uh, this international group, the ITEX, the International Tundra Experiment, um, got together and said, hey, you know, the, the geologists are, or the, you know, there's like the sea ice people that they started doing all the, the images that are now really famous now. There's the Greenland people, they're doing all the images that are really famous now. There's other people that have measured like um, temperatures in wells like oil, old former oil wells. And so, so like, what is botanist? What, what can we do to, to join the club, if you will, to document what we know is gonna be climate change? Because um, climate change was settled science in the late eighties. So by the nineties, everyone was just, how are we gonna document it? Um, so ITEX got together and they said, hey, let's just do a little warming experiment. And that way we don't have to wait 30 years to publish anything. We can, we can show kind of experimental what plants do when they warm. And these are the sites that were the original sites. And this is my site was one of the originals. And I started in 1995, the group started in 1990. And my major professor who was also the person who started the group was also um, the, the president of the International Arctic Science Committee, which is, you know, they were talking about IASC or the Ar or Arctic Council a minute ago. They, they interfaced and, and he was one of the first presidents. So, so in grad school, I knew a lot of the geopolitical stuff. I know less of it now, uh, but I had to because my boss was, was the president. Um, so just simple stuff that we do, we count plants, um, measure when flowering is, um, you know, document the vegetation, and so here's just a, a, a quick um, vegetation change. So this is in our control plots. So just nothing. Uh, so this is just natural warming, if you will, the warming experience. And you can see, so we've got shrubs are increasing. Evergreen shrubs are really increasing. Forbs increasing. Forbs like um, dandelion stuff. Um, graminoids, grasses are increasing. So they're all, so the plants are really increasing is the point here. Um, bryophytes, mosses and stuff staying about the same. Lichens for the moment um, are increasing. And then there's also just the standing dead. Um, lemmings went through in Zaptus. So, you know, that fluctuates quite a bit. Um, but the point here is plants are really increasing. If we do our little chambers, because we did chambers is kind of a, um, <clears throat> forecast what the future will look like, that trend just continues. Um, graminoids and, and shrubs really increase. If I just put a line here as 100%, um, you can have more than 100% cover because you can have two layers of stuff. So like a forest would have multiple layers of, of plants. Um, when I started, there was lots of open ground. Now there isn't. Um, there's still a little bit in the natural, in the chambers, it's 100% it's plant cover, uh, vascular plant cover, I should say. 
And um, so, so, and this is higher up Arctic. So, so again, the point is, it's not just tree line moving north or, or shrubs moving north. It's everything getting a little bigger. We do a lot of other stuff too. So this is just a simple one where you just stick a, a rod until it hits the frozen surface. But you know, we measure temperature, wetness, that kind of stuff. Um, we do carbon flux. You know, recent is fun. This is my son with a drone. Here's me. It's kind of fun. Um, you know, so you just take. So we're trying to do landscape type things. So here's just kind of a quick summary of changes occurring. It's less white, more plants and carbon is being released. Um, result is there's a lot of activity in the Arctic, research activity. Um, and then kind of to, to feed back into the, the video, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of research activity and now there's all this other activity. And that's mostly because of the, the changes in sea ice. Um, you know, that you can ship there. So, so that's my little spiel and I'll stop sharing and uh, take questions. I don't currently see any questions into the chat, but I want to encourage people at home if you do have questions to chat me directly. So I uh, I would be under Hasp Virtual Classroom. Yep. So so the question is methane release on the from the tundra. Um, I I tried to use the term carbon. And not carbon dioxide, because if it's in dry areas, you release carbon dioxide. If you're in wet areas, when you break stuff down, you release methane. It's no different than if you're, if you're going through a wetland around here. Um, and you, you know, you, if you're stomping around in your waders going duck hunting or whatever, it smells like methane. Um, because anaerobic decomposition will release methane. So if you're in a wet area, you release methane. Much of the Arctic is wet. So it's actually a methane source as opposed to a carbon dioxide source. Um, if you're in a drier area, you'd release carbon dioxide. So it's really just a matter of the, the temperature or the moisture balance. Methane is a more potent greenhouse gas by a lot, but it also doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long. So, um, I forget the exact amount, but way less, like uh, five to 10 times less. So, so it's a more immediate, but then it could come out of the, so it, it's a balance. But regardless, it's carbon release, um, carbon dioxide, dry, methane, wet. And, and what's really fun is um, during the winter, um, well, this methane release, you can actually light it on fire. <laughs> So, so there's some fun pictures of people that have, you'll get these methane bubbles. You can actually, um, you can find bubbles in the lakes. Usually they're covered in snow, but sometimes you'll have it, the snow's all blown off and you can look for bubbles and you can pop into them and light them. It's kind of fun. So. Other questions? This one right here. Obviously, uh, Yeah. So, so the question is, is there a perverse incentive for these Arctic countries to let climate change happen because it'll be a more favorable environment in the Arctic? Um, I joke, but it, it's actually true. My, when I started in the 90s, um, 
one of the, the other grad students that I spent part of the summer with was Russian. And he, he'd say, oh, we've known about climate change for a long time. We just didn't say anything. Um, and um, that being said, Russia has been way ahead of us in, in terms of signing on to treaties and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, Canada will do a lot better agriculturally. Um, I mean, you can see that the breadbasket is already moving north. Um, that there, there's, a, there's a big caveat though, that um, what we're seeing right now is the fires in Siberia are horrific. I mean, the, the, I mean it's, it's like California, it's just there's less people. So, um, and the same with the Alaska. Um, so most of the people, but more fundamentally, you, you have in your mind what the weather is supposed to be, and that's a preconceived based on what it was when you were younger. And, and you're just kind of used to that. The, 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 the one that I, I teach environmental science, so the, the, the Corn Belt, you know, you think of Iowa for corn, right? Well, one of the climate projections is the Corn Belt is basically Lake Superior. There's a problem there, there's lakes. But, but if you go to like um, north of the Sault Ste. Marie, they don't know how to grow corn there. I mean, they actually do grow some potatoes and stuff, but they're not like corn people. So, so people are used to what they're used to. So, so that perverse um, incentive is not so much because because it's just different and no one likes change. Um, and from a, from a local resident kind of thing, many people are used to being able to jump on a snowmobile from like October to April and go anywhere, anywhere in the world from their perspective. Um, there's, that's unsafe now in a lot of, communities um, because it's warmed and so forth. So there, and, and you've got um, buildings that were built on good permafrost. Now that permafrost is thawing, so the buildings collapse. So there's a lot of infrastructure problems. Um, and, but the bigger thing is it's just different than what you're used to and different is bad in general. I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first being any traces of animal migration being researched? Yeah, so, so there's a lot of work on animal migration. I'm not an expert on that. Um, I will say though that the Arctic is ex exceedingly um, um, there's a lot of variability. So so you could have, so the, the warmest year, right now we've got these warm years, but the warmest year now was experienced in the 60s uh, because it fluctuates so much. Um, so now, now we've got like the warmest year, warmest year, warmest year. So it's, it's way warmer than it was then. But the point is they had like a really warm year, then it would be a really cold year and then a warm year and a cold year. Um, so, so there's just a lot more variability in the Arctic in general. Um, so a lot of the migration, they just take a lot longer to, to, to really change because they're already pre-adapted to like it being not normal <laughs> uh, because there's, there's just a lot of variability. Um, but that being said, the, the waterfowl in particular, the goose populations are exploding and we actually see them around here. And, and some of the explosions are actually more because of stuff down here. Um, but there, there's whole areas, particularly in Canada, that are, are just the wetland kind of habitat that these different geese go to that are just being wiped out because there's just so many geese. They, 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 they just destroy an area and then they have to go to a different area the next year. So yes, there are changes. Um, they're generally a little bit less than you would expect because of variability, but there's but the big population explosions are, are happening. Good, thank you very much. You have about four more questions in the chat. The next one is, who are the eight members of the Arctic Council? Oh, that's like a quiz for me. But it, um, so it's Denmark, Sweden, Norway, 
Finland, Iceland, Canada, US, and Russia. Hey, I got it. So, um, <laughs> she got an A. So, so that's them. And then, but there's a lot of other people that um, have done Arctic stuff. Um, you know, they're talking about China, uh, but Japan's done, a, you know, a lot of countries have also Arctic and Antarctic um, research. Thank you. What is uh, happening with the population in the area? Are the struggles for whaling having an impact? No, people, um, the bigger impact is the internet and just sitting on your butt watching cable, no different than here. Um, so the populations are actually increasing quite a bit. Um, um, yeah, now whaling is a really big deal because if you go to the grocery store, it's wicked expensive. Like a gallon of milk can be eight, eight bucks, but, but you could buy, you know, canned whatever for about the same price as here. So it just depends on what it is, but meat can be fairly expensive and people are just used to having their traditional foods. Mm -hmm. but, but in terms of actual population, populations in most of the Arctic countries or most of the Arctic populations are increasing because they, you know, because they don't have to struggle to survive. Okay. Yep. So the question is about sea level rise in the Arctic um, and, and the con contribution. Sea ice doesn't contribute to, to sea level rise because it's already on the water. So if you melt an ice cube or not, it, it, it doesn't really contribute globally. Um, the melting of Greenland makes a big difference. Um, between Greenland and Antarctica, um, all the other glaciers on the rest of the planet are irrelevant. Um, there's just so much more ice there. Um, so those make a, so Greenland melting is a big deal. The, the, the melting of Greenland right now is contributing more to sea level rise than the melting of Antarctica, just because it's at a faster rate right now. Um, ultimately, it'll be more Antarctica. And then to the um, vulnerability, yes, there's lots of places. Almost all of your Arctic communities are coastal. That's true globally, but it's even more so in the Arctic because it's not like you're farming and, you know, the I mean, so, so it's all, you're farming from the ocean. Um, so all of the native populations, natural communities are on the coast and, and they're all vulnerable um, to sea level rise. And some of them are on these really low lying areas that are just being wiped out. Okay, so, so the question, this is a great one because I'm a plant guy and this is like a plant, you know, the ratio of annuals to perennials, there are no annuals, period. Um, so uh, I think there is one weed that sometimes shows up here and there. Now, that being said, if you go right next to the airport in town, there's some, there's some dandelions and stuff, uh, but they're technically perennials. So um, um, I don't, there, there's almost no perennials and when you go back in time, you got to go back. I don't know, going, you'd have to go back a pretty long time to, to get into a realm where, where that balance would be different because tundra in general just doesn't have annuals. Thank you. Um, one uh, question, I'm not sure if this refers back to something else that was discussed, but it simply says reciprocal changes in the Antarctic Reciprocal what? It says reciprocal changes in the Antarctic. Okay. And that's 
Okay, go ahead. Well, so I actually taught a course to Antarctica. Um, it was more of a boondoggle to go to Antarctica, but um, it um, there's major changes in Antarctica. The, 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 there are no, there were no plants in Antarctica except for on the peninsula. There's mosses and lichen, um, but on land it's almost all ice and then hard rock. That's changing that there as some of the areas as some of the ice fields melt around the coastal areas, and you're starting to get some um, some vascular plants um, and a lot more moss coverage and and lichen coverage. But but the big changes in Antarctica are penguins, right? I mean, everyone cares about penguins. And that then relates to sea ice. And that um, when you and that relates to krill. You know, the, the krill are those little shrimp-like guys that, that hang out. And they, they, they do really well. Uh, they don't just do well in the open ocean. They, they just don't. Um, so if there's sea ice, they do really well under that sea ice. And that sea ice becomes like a, a conduit for algae and all this other stuff. And so as you remove the sea ice, the productivity actually goes down, which is kind of counterintuitive to what you think. Um, if it's really thick ice, then it doesn't do well. But, but so, so most of the changes in Antarctica are associated with that, um, the sea ice, the, the, the distribution of it and how the krill are doing. And in general, that's very variable, um, but penguin populations aren't doing well, uh, many of them. Um, so that's kind of my short answer. Okay, uh, the next question in the chat is, how does this impact travel, roads, oil, and gas use? So um, the, the video did a really good job of, of talking about open water. So um, when I, so, so almost all of the, the US research was originally done by the Navy. I actually um, started my research in the Na Navy Arctic Research Laboratory, NARL. Um, and, you know, so they're looking at how to shoot a machine gun with like without your finger falling off and, and, you know, all these different military related. Um, so when I started in the 90s, you know, the Cold War was ended or in the middle of ending and so forth. And, and, and the Navy was ready to pull the plug. And then by about the late 90s, early 2000s, they said, well, wait a minute, there's climate change. We might be able to actually have aircraft carriers in the Arctic. We should probably do some research again. Um, so, so the shift now is that openness of the, the travel lanes. There's, there are cruise ships that have gone up. Um, and, and you can do that because it's just open water, not even ice during you know, July. Um, and, and you can see by radar if ice is moving your way. Um, and then you just turn around and go the other way. Um, so that one's a huge difference. On, on land, it, it hasn't really changed nearly as much. Um, I mean, it's always been a, a pain. To be honest, it's easier to travel during the winter than it is during the summer because it's just a muddy mess. Um, so in a sense, the land has become less travelable um, with climate change because it's a muddy mess, but it's the, the ocean that's the bigger deal. And the idea for potentially offshore oil, I mean, you know, that was a really big deal a few years ago. Um, it turns out that that's stupid because it's really expensive. Um, Arctic oil is really expensive. If we didn't already have all the equipment up there, then it would make no economic sense whatsoever to do that because gas is so cheap right now. Um, and as gas gets more expensive, then the alternative is cheaper. So, so you'll never be in a position where you'll make money off of selling new Arctic oil. I'll just say that. I can say that, not political at all. They're just economically, it's just not gonna happen. Um, Shell was doing all this stuff. That now that's different if you've already got all the equipment there and you're just, you're just sucking a little more and they'll do that. But to go to a whole new area and then put in all that infrastructure, you're not gonna make enough money to do that because oil's too cheap. Um, you know, Shell and all that was gonna do, all, you know, Trump was gonna 
get in the office, we're going to dig everywhere. We didn't. Um, and it was just sheer economics. Um, if there's some other things like, I don't know much about diamonds and gold, but um, those, those, that would be different. But oil is what everyone talks about when they talk about the Arctic. It's, it, it's just economically silly. Another question from the audience. I've been a slow believer in being all this, but he spent two weeks in Alaska on American cruise line. As you know, Glacier Bay is scary place. Yep. Up in Glacier Bay, I still remember the markers they showed us. That glacier had receded 250 feet this past year. That was incredible. Yeah, uh, the, so, so, so the comment is the, these glaciers are retreating at huge amounts. Yeah. Um, go to Patagonia. They used to have huge ice fields. They're just gone. Um, th there won't be um, glaciers in most places other than Greenland and Antarctica relatively soon. Um, if you go to anywhere, any mountain chain in the world, you go to a restaurant and they've got a picture of the glacier and I guarantee it's, it's receded like a ton. Uh, and that there, there's, a, there's a few rare, rare exceptions because remember glaciers are a balance of the temperature and how much snow you got last winter. There's a few places in Scandinavia where they've just gotten a little bit more snow because of climate change, because of climate change pre precipitation patterns. But basically worldwide, um, glaciers are disappearing. Himalayas, you know, they rely on the ice for, for water throughout the, you know, lots of places, um, you know, their water for the next year they've got real water issues because of that. So it's, it's a big deal globally. More questions from the live audience? Any support from Zoom? Let me just make one, one last comment, what, what, if you're thinking of one more. Um, the, the video really talked about the competition in the Arctic. It's a big dramatization that, that I hope in my back of my mind that was very Trump laden, if you will, in his old news now. Um, the Arctic is a weird place. Um, we, we collaborated with Russia throughout the Cold War. My major professor did re research in, the, in Russia. Um, when, when the Soviet Union failed, we actually mailed Actually, you couldn't mail because it would get lost. We had people um, hide equipment in their laundry, in their suitcases for, for our Russian colleagues to do research, um, you know, without any money, essentially. And we actually gave them money. We'd have people that would sneak money in their underwear and stuff, and they'd give them money so they could keep doing research. Um, because there were these longstanding, you know, the Arctic Council and all that. I mean, those are been established because Arctic people or people, they're the same plants, they're the same animals, they're the same, it's the same biome for all these different countries, which is very different than anywhere else in the world. Um, I mean, it'd be like if everyone had the same forest as we have in our backyard. Uh, so you just naturally get along with them because you talk about the same deer hunting and you know, we like to go shoot squirrels and, you know, shoot some ducks or whatever. So you talk about shooting ducks and squirrels and all this other stuff. So it's the same biome. People have collaborated for a long, long time. Um, there's, um, it's a harsh environment, so you kind of have to, um, you know, you don't ask someone what their politics are when they're freezing to death. Or um, if their snowmobile breaks down, you pick someone up. If you're on the, if you're driving down the road, and you see a polar bear and there's someone walking, you pick them up, you don't ask them anything else, you just you know, give them a ride. Um, and, and that's just how it's always been in the Arctic. There are, you know, what this didn't go into is the icebreakers. You know, um, the US only has two icebreakers. Russia has like 40. Um, so we've been reliant on them forever. And, and we still will be because, you know, now they're talking about, you know, they're in the process of developing some more icebreakers, but it'll be you know another three or four years before they're online. And regardless, Russia's got forty, and we'll end up with like six or seven instead of two. Um, but but there's always been that international collaboration, 
and it's usually and it's been focused around research. So as a researcher, the reason why I stayed as a grad student was it was just so neat that there was these international groups that you could all get together and talk about the same stuff. Um, and and because of that, that these these groups you know do really well um, and have a long history of working together. So I'm very optimistic about that continuing, irrespective of crazy politics. So, so shipping is probably more significant than no military. So, so the question about shipping, shipping is a big, 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 big deal. Um, because if you start now shipping, which you can, it is way cheaper to, to go, you know, from Europe uh, through the Arctic than it is, you know, around, go through the Suez Canal or go underneath, um, you know, Tierra del Fuego and all that. Um, so, but if you do that, you have to have, ships have issues. So you have to have Coast Guard presence. And that's what the, the big, this, um, I don't know, the backdrop to this was, there was a lot of talk in the, in the last couple of years about increasing our, our capacity so that you could um, have Coast Guard, um, you know, throughout. Um, I'll say right now, the, 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 the location that I'm at was part of the Dew Line. Dew Line was the, I don't know what the heck it stood for, but it's uh, every 50 miles, there is a station from the, the islands and, um, you know, the Aleutian Islands and, you know, kind of the end of Alaska, all the way through Greenland, there's a, there's a station every 50 miles. And that, that was pointed towards Russia to, to see the missiles coming. And, and what's really humorous is, you know, I used to always listen to my earbuds um, and, 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 and you'd hear it zap because it would go zzz, zzz, every time, like every couple seconds. And, and, and it would screw with some of the equipment for one of the, the guys. And so he'd, he'd ask, hey, could you tell me when, they're, when you're gonna do this so I could do my equipment or not? And he'd say, no, that's against the law. I mean, this is military and we're, you know, and so all you have to do is put on your headphones and hear if it's zip zipping or not. But, but, there's, but, but we've always had that. So every 50 miles, there is a station and those are still operational. Um, those are some of the, the jokes that, you know, if you screw up in the military, you, it gets sent to one of those. Um, you know, they're actually really neat places if you're only there for a little while. Well, in a sense, in a sense they're following what aircraft did. I mean, going over the top of the world, and now they put ships over the top of the world. Yep. So they're kind of following the footsteps of air, air transportation. Yeah, air transportation has been going over the Arctic for a long time. When you go to Europe, it's, it's cool if you stay awake um, to see Greenland. Um, I mean, I, I haven't been to Greenland, I've been to Iceland, but, but I've seen Greenland a bunch of times going to Europe. <laughs> oh. The rest of that's becoming a, a reality. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Warn it, yeah, that's right. Yep. And they, they changed their name, um, but, but they're still there. And they, they're still operational and they still, there's usually a couple guys there um, year round. Any more coming in from uh, from Zoom land? Look like it. So, Bob, thank you very much for the yeah, presentation like today. It's uh, we've learned a lot. <laughs> All right. And, uh, I think that kind of wraps it up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And from everybody um, out in uh, remote learning, we appreciate it as well. And uh, for those of you who are remote, I'm gonna go ahead and close the class and we look forward to seeing you again soon.